Hi, welcome everybody. We're going to give it just a couple of seconds um, to let a few other folks join and then we'll get started with our introductions. We're really happy to see you all here today. Yes. We've all gotten to the end of another week, or I should say it's, it's four o'clock here in the Eastern time zone. Lisa Kathleen is on the other side of the country, so it's earlier in the day. I'm still early afternoon. I've been seeing some entertaining memes like lately about how there is no end of the week and it just seems to keep going on and on and every weekend is just the same as every other day. So uh, luckily those are making me laugh, not cry at this point. It is starting to feel that way. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Haran and glad to be back joining you today. I'm a part of our Guidepost at Home Elementary Distance Learning Team. Um, and I also happen to be a former Montessori Elementary teacher. Um, so if there are any questions, um, and I hope there are lots of questions that, that come our way, I can also hopefully help answer some of them. I just wanted to first let everyone know that we will be recording this webinar um, and it will be appearing within our elementary family framework platform um, sometime soon. Um, so you can go back and, and check there or refer friends if hopefully you found it useful and can let other people know. Um, if you have questions as Lisa is talking and I'll introduce her in just a moment, um, please put them in the questions panel. And if you could actually go ahead and find that, um, so we can make sure that you know where it is and that it's working. And let us know where you're joining us from and how old your child is. We'd love to know a little bit more about our audience. This is my favorite part. Kelly's now going to tell us where all of the people are rolling in from and how old your children are. So we've got Italy. My son is seven. Wonderful. Um, Raleigh, North Carolina, my boys are 10 and 13. Super. Hello, North Carolina. E buongiorno, Italia. Um, we've got some folks with younger children. Uh, nine and five-year-old, an eight-year-old from Orlando. Boys oh, are hello, not from Florida. We've got Illinois. Yeah, all right. Well, that's a good start. Great, um, super, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm very excited to once again introduce Lisa Kathleen. Um, you may have had the pleasure of seeing her on some other webinar work that we've done together. Um, but if not, I'd love to tell you a little bit about her background. She is an AMI trained Montessori elementary guide, um, a parenting coach, and a parenting educator with over 20 years of experience working with hundreds of families. Um, and she's also a Montessori mom. So within our organization here at Higher Ground and Guidepost, she's a member of the Prepared Montessorian training team. Um, and Lisa is just as passionate about Montessori as she is about parenting, which you're about to find out if you, you haven't had the pleasure of hearing her already. So at this point, I will turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Kelly. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm part of the Prepared Montessori and Teacher Training Team here at Guidepost, working primarily with the elementary teachers. I'm also the parent of a 14-year-old now. That's, oh, wait, let me show you her picture. There she is. That's her in the picture. And she was about eight at that time. I am a trained Montessori guide for six to 12 year olds with years of classroom experience in both lower elementary and later in upper elementary. So lower elementary is six to nine year olds and upper elementary is nine to 12 year olds. And I've spent a good portion of my adult life surrounded by elementary age children and enjoying every minute of it. For 10 years, I also ran my own business as a parenting coach full-time and parent educator. So that was extremely enjoyable for me and I love, love working with parents. I read my first book about Montessori when I was 15 
And I also started reading books about parenting that same year. I had come, I had come to the conclusion that parenting and educating were very similar. And so if you knew a lot about one, it would help you with the other. And so basically doing that at 15, you can tell that I was a huge parenting and education nerd and I continue to be so. So after reading that book, I was so certain that Montessori was the way to go that 12 years later, I went to Italy, so buongiorno Italia, and studied to become an elementary guide. And I came back, uh, moved back at the time to where I lived, which was Canada. And I had a classroom of 24 students that was actually in a tiny Canadian basement with very small windows. And so setting up the environment was extremely important in that particular space. Um, to, to really support the children's learning. In normal times, I spend a big portion of my time filming videos of myself giving the Montessori lessons for six to 12 year olds for our teacher training programs. So you may see some of those lessons if you choose to subscribe to our series of lessons in the elementary album that you can find on our Family Framework site. So, we are in a very challenging time right now as a culture and our homes are more important than ever especially if your child is learning at home the montessori approach has a strong strong emphasis on the child's physical environment and you probably know that a montessori classroom looks very different than a typical classroom and if you don't know much about montessori we're going to cover some um, some of those details about how it looks different and I'll show you quite a few photos as well and we're going to dive into why that is but more importantly how you can follow some of those principles at home to maximize your child's independence and to maximize their engagement with their learning so I would love for you to post in the chat uh, or in the questions section now what you are hoping to get out of the webinar, and also what your child's current situation is. And in a couple minutes, I'm gonna ask Kelly to give us a quick synopsis of that so that I can also target the information I'm sharing specifically to your circumstances and your questions. So, um, and any questions that we don't get to, we're going to address at the end of the call. And if we don't get to them there, we'll address them on our family framework um, uh, forum so you'll be able to go in there and see your questions and my responses there so we're going to make sure that's all covered so once you've posted again in the chat what you're hoping to get out of the webinar and what your child's current school situation is then um, actually go ahead and do that and then moving forward throughout the webinar feel free to pop any questions that you have into the chat let's see I'm going to move us to the next slide here and we're going to go ahead and begin. So our surroundings have a huge effect on our ability to concentrate, to work, to innovate and to be creative. This is true for adults and it's also true and especially true for children, especially during the elementary years. Between the ages of 6 and 12, children's abstract minds are developing. So they still learn best when they start with the concrete and move to abstraction from there. So because of this, the elementary child is highly aware of the concrete physical environment and how that can affect their learning. We often hear that the external world reflects our internal world. If our mind is disorganized, our workspace will be disorganized, for example. This goes the other way as well. An ordered external world helps the child to create internal order. And this is especially important right now as our children have experienced a huge upheaval in their daily lives, almost all of our children, I think they're a few families out there that the, the change was not as extreme, but for many of us, the upheaval in our daily lives was pretty extreme. And this is especially true for the children. 
So as schools shut down, as parents' work schedules changed dramatically, as stress levels rose around the child, as regular activities have just stopped, an ordered physical environment at home will give your child a sense of security, a sense of control, and a sense that all is not chaos. And Montessori realized how very important this was. She deeply understood the importance of the environment in the child's learning. She said that if we could prepare the environment well, the child will, to a large extent, educate herself. And here's the quote. Education is a natural process carried out by the human individual and it's acquired not by listening to words, but by experiences in the environment. The teacher's first duty is to watch over the environment, and this takes precedence over all else. If we create an environment that inspires and encourages and supports our children to learn, they will do the learning with very little additional effort from us. So throughout this talk, I'm going to bring up some principles. Let's see here, sorry. Um, I'm going to bring up some principles that uh, apply to setting up your home for at-home learning. And I'm going to start with this one. Appeal to the elementary child's social sense. So our elementary children, well, let me just say it this way. You may have noticed that your elementary child is not particularly interested in keeping the environment orderly. So I wanted to offer a pro tip here. So that as we're talking through all of the other principles, you have some hope that you'll be able to work with your child to keep things in a reasonably tidy and organized state. The elementary age child is most likely to be inspired to keep the environment in order when we appeal to the child's sense of responsibility towards others. Because the child of this age is highly social and learning and developing responsibility developmentally, to inspire your child to keep things tidy or to do some cleaning, you can draw attention to how all members of the family need to work together to take care of the home. And you can talk about how the aesthetics of the home affect everyone. So whether it's about keeping your work area tidy or the child's work area tidy, or tidying the kitchen after a meal or washing the family car, the conversation sounds something like this. Honey, we all use the car. So let's think of ways that we can all help take care of the car. And then at that point, you might work with your child to make a list of all the things that the car needs to keep running and who does certain parts of that process to keep the car running. And then ask, what part of taking care of the car would you like to do? Now you can work together with your child to make a plan for them to help with that process. So for the child's workspace, it might sound something like this. We all need to be able to find all of the things that are in our home. And we all enjoy our home when it looks neat and tidy. We can relax better. We all need to keep our workspaces tidy so that we can all feel relaxed in our home and so that everyone can find the things they need. But that's a bit of an aside. I wanted to include it as it's a key piece of keeping the environment in order in the home for the elementary child. But today we're going to focus on how to set up your home to work well for your elementary child's learning. Now I'm going to switch back and I'm going to get some feedback from Kelly about some specific questions that some of you have and, um, and about your learning situations right now. Absolutely. Um, so it looks like we have a pretty good mix of folks um, coming from traditional schools and they have some kind of at home. Um, virtual program that they're doing with their current school that they want to supplement. We also right. have a few Montessori teacher parents um, that are sort of coming at this from both angles, 
for how to support their classrooms um, and their own children. Um, and a few also from Montessori schools that are um, helping to support their children at home. And as wonderful. As far as sort of just themes of what I'm seeing coming coming through, um, it looks like people are wanting some help with organization, um, mm -hmm. some sources for at-home materials or ideas about that, and mm -hmm. practical tips for how to do this. Got it. Oh, you're in the right place. Great. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate that. All right, so I think you're all going to really enjoy the content of this webinar, and I'm super excited to dive right in. Here's our next principle. Identify spaces for various purpose purposes. So I'm sure you've heard that one of the key ways to improve your sleep is to make sure that you use your bed primarily for sleeping. Don't do other things in the bed that are going to distract you from sleep. If you want your child to focus on any particular activity, the principle's the same. Have a space designated for that kind of activity. Children of this age need to move a lot as well, so having a few spaces in their home that they can work in will help them to kind of keep them moving and help keep that energy at a, at a level that allows them to work effectively. So let's talk about what some of those spaces might be. The first is a space for big or messy work. Elementary age children love building things and they especially love building big things. So they're still transitioning from that more concrete to a more abstract worldview. So they need to do things that are concrete. They might demonstrate knowledge that they've learned, new knowledge, through art, through a skit or a performance, with a dance. I had one child who learned all of the ways that seeds traveled, and then she made a dance with different pieces of music and different moves to show all of the different ways that seeds traveled. They might make a poster. They might do a large painting of a world map, as you see here. They might practice skip counting by threes with actual skipping or by laying out many, many, many groups of three beans or pebbles or pieces of Lego. So be sure to designate a place where children can do this kind of big work. It should be easy to clean up for artwork and it should have enough space to do movement dance or exercise, make an obstacle course, do yoga. You may have more than one space. My personal house is very small, my house here. We have about a six by six square foot space in the living room for dance, movement, or performance. And we have about an eight by eight square foot space outside of our front door where there's some concrete. That's where we do our messy things on a plastic tablecloth. We also have a broom so that my child can go out. My, she's 14 now, but she still does lots of big projects so that she can go out and sweep up after herself if she's, if she's done something messy in the public space in front of my house. So my daughter has helped me out there to recover a chair. She's carved a bow and arrow out there. So just a couple of the things that she's done. But she knows where to find the plastic sheet and where to find the broom. So all of that's important when you think about your messy or your big workspace. Here's another kind of space, or actually another couple of examples, the messy or big workspace. So whether you have outdoor spaces or indoor spaces, you might find that you need different spaces and different solutions for different kinds of activities. As much as possible, think this through ahead of time together with your child so that when they come up with an activity, they can go ahead and do it and they know how to choose the space. Your child will also need a desk area. 
when you designate specific spaces for specific kinds of work, you're providing external cue, sorry, excuse me, external cues for your child around beginning and ending a specific task. I definitely recommend having your child work on a device at a desk, especially if you're having screen time issues. If your child has a lesson or is doing an activity on the device, when the lesson ends, they put the device away, then they decide how to follow up with that work or they go on to the next work. This can prevent the scenario where they're on the device for hours, for example, because there was no clear ending to a particular task or no clear location where that activity happens. If you have the space, definitely consider having one area where you have your computer or your device and another area where your child can do writing, art, or other non-digital tasks. And if not, set up your one area so that your child can easily set aside or shut down their device when it's not in use to reduce distraction. And this area can be used for any online work, but it will also be used for any writing or drawing work, so it has to be comfortable for both and as ergonomic as possible. Let's see here. And this is what you're avoiding, though sometimes this is pretty fun too. Nice to have some fun time as well. The other space that you'll wanna consider in your home is a space for food prep. This will really help your child to be independent with snack preparation and even with lunch preparation. They might also go ahead and get started on dinner prep where, while you're still finishing work. So your food prep area should also be good for any science experiments and for art prep. And you'll need to make sure that things are provided so that if your child is doing a science experiment that uh, with something that you don't want to end up having for dinner, that they know which part of the kitchen they can use for that, for example, and how to clean up afterwards. Also, maybe how to alert you that a certain science experiment was done in that space so that you can double check to make sure that there's nothing left over. Also, all of the things that they might need for art prep might be happening in your kitchen. So they might need to go in and fill up a bowl of water, for example, if they're painting. So just really make sure that you have guidelines and specific things that they might need for those kinds of activities accessible in the kitchen area or in your, um, in your food prep area. And here's a reading area. Your child will need an area where they can go to read listen to podcasts or listen to audiobooks. This might be specially designated with a special chair or you might have a couple of areas in the house that are specific for reading. Again, this is going to help your child to relax into the activity and to enjoy it, but also when the activity is finished, they put their book away, they turn off the podcast, they stop the audiobook and they go and they do the next activity. So again, having these designated areas is gonna be really helpful. I wanna also just really draw attention again to the fact that elementary children are highly social. This is the key age for children to develop understanding of their own personality and how that personality interacts with the personality of others. So they, at this age, they're learning to collaborate, to discover their social strengths and their social challenges. They discover what they have to offer to others and they love to practice that. So your elementary child will need interaction. Be sure to set up some spaces for your child to Skype with grandma, to show grandma or grandpa what's, what they're working on, uh, or to collaborate with a friend, and just do your best to support collaborative work however you can. So just be aware that you'll need a space that they're far enough away from your workspace if you are also working, that those conversations won't be disruptive to your work or to your other child's work. So you'll need to really figure out where to put 
um, some of the different parts of uh, or some of the different uh, digital devices particularly that that will be uh, interaction focused for your child in our virtual elementary classrooms for example the elementary child may work together with another child in the breakout room or they might even sit together and just chat while having lunch so maybe for your child having that company over lunch is important you might want to call a friend or a cousin and set up a lunch date where they can sit and chat and if your child is younger or an only child or more of an extrovert your child may also want to work near you for at least part of their day so definitely keep that in mind while you're setting up workspaces you're really working with this balance of a variety of needs. Here's another principle. Less stuff equals more independence for your child. So we moved when my daughter was 10 and I have to tell you we cleaned out 10 years worth of stuff from my home. So if your youngest child is six or seven and just moving into this new developmental stage or if they're 10 and you just haven't cleaned out all of that stuff from their younger years since then and you have a ton of stuff please know that i am totally relating to you right now do your best to clear out as much space as possible you want to reduce distractions to give physical and mental space for focused work and to increase independence if learning materials are neat tidy easy to find and clearly organized your child will be able to be a lot more independent with their learning and we're going to break this down a little bit more so definitely start by getting rid of toys books learning materials that are not being used if some of them have potential then put them in the have potential box so maybe you'll bring them back out at different times but start by clearing your space of things that your child is not using yet if your child's not yet ready to get rid of some of those things, consider packing them up and labeling them Susie's special box so that she can look at it again in a couple of years or even a couple of months if she would like to take a look. And then you can just take out some of the things that you want to use from those storage areas later on. So here is a shelf for art supplies in one of our classrooms. This shelf focuses on fabric arts. So there are balls of wool there on the top shelf for finger knitting, which is a great activity, by the way, for children needing to build finger strength and dexterity for writing. They might do knitting, they might do crochet. And you can also see there on the second shelf from the top, embroidery hoops. Just to the right, there's a, a piece of fabric with sample stitches on it. You can see it there. And in the basket on the left, there are some uh, colors of embroidery floss, maybe four or five, and a smaller container with a needle or two. And I have to tell you, when I chose this picture to post here, I was looking at this and I was actually wanting to do embroidery. And I'm not an embroidery person. But I looked at this and I kind of thought, ooh, I see, well, I wonder what stitches are there. I could do some of those. I wanted to do embroidery because it was here and easy to do. It's clear exactly what I would need to do to go do embroidery myself. That gives me the opportunity to then take this information and go and be creative with it. Whereas, if I see something like this, I have no interest in trying to untangle all of that and get started. I wouldn't even know where to start or what to choose. I have no idea what to do with this. And this is true for your child's academic work as well. You want to break things down, start small, include a few choices, and include everything the child needs to be independent. Notice also, though, that this activity is open-ended. So I have everything I need to be independent with embroidery here. 
but it's also open-ended. Nobody's told me exactly what I need to do to start and what I need to do to finish. It's not a worksheet. It's an open-ended activity that I can pursue and continue with for as long as I like. Here's our next principle. Group materials. This classroom is one of our earliest guidepost classrooms. And you can see here that it's very homey. Once you've gotten rid of what you know you don't need, group and organize what is left. For younger children especially, store all of the materials that are needed for a specific activity together. So you can use a tray, a basket, a bowl, a pre got. Especially when you're just getting started, your goal is to make it as easy as possible for your child to find and do the activity independently. So in this classroom, you can see how every activity is in its own container. So each set of cards with an interesting vocabulary activity is in a basket of its own. The clock activity will have small squares of paper beside it with little clocks for the child to practice with, or a stamp set. Actually, I think that's a stamp set there on the shelf in front of it, so that the child can stamp the little clock on a piece of paper and then draw the time on there. You can also see that the books associated with certain activities are together with the activity itself. So group the materials. Keep the supplies limited. So this is a general supply shelf for a classroom of 25 children. And even here, you can see that there are just a few of each thing. When you limit quantities of consumables especially, you can avoid overwhelming your child. It makes it a lot easier to keep the space tidy for your child. And it also inspires more appreciation for the materials. So your child is more likely to use the materials more carefully, and they're more likely to produce fewer pieces of good work that they can be proud of, rather than a whole bunch of pieces of rushed work. So think five or six pieces of paper, one or two paintbrushes of different sizes, one pair of scissors, one eraser or maybe two, etc. Keep the supplies limited. These are actually the cleaning supplies for one of our elementary classrooms. And on the top shelf there, you also see the community book where the children keep their agenda for class meetings. You can definitely have a family meeting book at home with an agenda for meetings. And they also record solutions to any problems that they sort out in that book. But you see that that's appealing. It's displayed somewhere prominently. So how and where you display the important things in your family's life will make a difference. You can also see here that it's gonna be a lot more appealing and easy for the child to go in and clean up a spill or something that's dropped on the floor when they have this kind of a cleaning area to draw from. You can see the watering can down there for the plants. You can see a cloth for the dirty cloths. And there in the back, the basket on the right is actually for work mats for the children. So the children could take out a work mat from that basket. Of course, it's a lot easier to inspire the child to clean when the shelf looks like this. And that brings us to the next principle. Make it beautiful. These shelves are beautiful. This is a science shelf in one of our classroom. the classrooms. Make your child's materials as beautiful, interesting, even breakable, real as possible. A real glass test tube. Children love real things and they love a pretty container. 
a pretty container can elevate an activity and entice your child. A real artist's paintbrush with a full lesson on how to care for the brush and that demonstrates how that brush works so much better than a typical paintbrush will inspire your child to be more careful, to take responsibility for the object, and to create more beautiful work. Let's go back to this picture here. Remember this? So this is my house. And I want to bring out how some of those principles were at play here in my home when my daughter was eight. So you can see there on the shelf to my left, you can see a teapot and a few teacups. So my daughter would often take the teapot and make us tea. We're Canadian. The second shelf has the very special teapot. If we had a friend over and they wanted a different kind of tea, we would make two pots of tea, one for that specific person. You can also see up there some vases. So my daughter has chosen a vase here in the front. This was in wintertime, and she's arranged some, um, some spruce or fir tree uh, fronds or whatever they're called in there. Up there on the second shelf on the left, there's a nut cracker. So we actually bought nuts whole so that my daughter could crack them herself. On the right, you can see where we used to play our music. So I took some time to specially buy a um, stereo that she could use even when she was much younger. So she used that even when she was three or four. It was very simple to use. You can see that her music choices are right there for her. Off in the distance, you can see a picture on the wall behind us there and underneath a glass shelf. The picture is of a Japanese doll. It's three-dimensional and beautifully folded. Underneath it is a shelf with a few more Japanese dolls on it. My daughter had special permission sometimes to climb up on the couch and take down those special, very breakable dolls off that special, very breakable glass shelf. So we've talked now about caring for the learning materials. Let's take some time to talk about caring for the finished work. So one of the things about the Montessori approach is that it results in a broad range of finished products, both tangible and intangible. Your child may create dioramas of how children live in other parts of the world, posters of research on lions or trees, models of the universe, timelines of the Sumerians, small note cards with vocabulary words with prefixes on them, board games for practicing math facts, cookbooks with ingredients that are from different parts of the plant, or a variety of dodeca, oh sorry, this is a dodecahedron down here in the bottom right of your screen, etc. They may create any of these things. Intangible finished products may include oral reports, plays, recitations, dances, exercise routines to work with various muscles, etc. To make a long story short, all of this creative exploration of different ideas creates storage issues during production and also once the work is finished. And so we recommend considering a few kinds of storage. This here is a beautifully decorated binder. In general, treat your child's work with care, respect, even reverence. The work your child does is the work of building their own capacity to contribute in the world, to follow their own dreams and goals, and to produce meaningful products. Even when the product itself is not exceptional, it's practice. It's an indication of the powerful work that your child is doing to build their own potential. So respect their work. 
and help them to respect it too. For simple storage of paper, use a binder. When I was teaching, one of the things that made a huge difference in my students' productivity was when I started suggesting that they decorate their finished work. They might write their favorite division problem of the day on its own special page and then decorate the page. Or they might write their finished work in ink with a fountain pen and decorate that page in ink. In my class, all the children practiced their handwriting because to be able to write their finished work with the fountain pen, they had to be able to handle the pen with a light touch and to write smoothly without stopping because if they stopped, they would get a big blob of ink. So show your child how to carefully hole punch their work or provide plastic sleeves for beautifully decorated work that your child doesn't want to hole punch. For those larger three-dimensional items, choose an area in your house that your child can display one or two of their favorite projects at a time. Store the rest on a special st storage shelf or in a box that's accessible to your child, but label it carefully and then invite your child to switch out display items every month or two. So rather than stuffing these items somewhere, store them in a box still, but knowing that you're gonna open that box again in a month and look through and possibly display the work. How the work is stored changes dramatically when you know the intention of the storage. For large flat items, your child can build a large artist's portfolio. Here's one built of cardboard and duct tape. It doesn't have to even have sides. And this one here, you could go even, you could actually go even much simpler than this one. You could use foam board and ribbons, for example, or cardboard and ribbons. Have your child be creative and store their beautiful finished work in a beautiful place. For videos or photos of intangible products, create a special folder on your child's device for finished work. And this is great for tangible products that you choose not to keep forever as well. So you can have that folder that includes all of their video productions and, and um, PowerPoints, for example, and it can also include any uh, photos of finished work that you're not gonna keep. Here's another principle. Prepare the digital environment as carefully as you prepare the physical environment. Remember again that less is more. Less stuff equals more independence. In this case, it also means more safety. So let's talk a little bit about how the digital and the physical worlds interact when we're talking about the screen. We recommend having a dedicated device that is just for your child's schoolwork. So on that device, you have just the apps that your child will need for their work. We recommend going for a whitelist rather than blacklisting certain things. So a whitelist means that you only allow certain sites. You start with none and you just allow the ones that you want your child to access. Find a service which has curated 20 or 30 safe general research sites for children and include them there. Over time, you can teach safety principles and open this up more. But for six and seven year olds, this is a great way to limit online distractions and the potential that your child will end up somewhere online that you don't want them to be. If they do have a general browser, make sure the sites that they can go to are bookmarked and the places that they need to go are bookmarked carefully. In the physical realm, when the child faces the wall and has their screen, it's going to allow them to focus better on what's happening for their work. 
The screen though, will then face the family and face the home. So that means that others will be able to see what's happening on the screen and you'll have a little bit more of a sense and a more community, a, a, a more of an ability to form a community around whatever's happening on the screen. Montessori said that the teacher must not content herself with merely providing an attractive environment. She must continuously think about this environment because a large part of the result depends on it. And this is the result we're looking for. The child who's focused on their work, fascinated by it, and doing work that is meaningful to the child. So those are the principles. And I'd love to open up now for questions or reflections. So please go ahead and pop any questions that you do have still into the chat. And Kelly, I would love it if you would share some of those with me. Absolutely. Um, so I have one from Lina. She asks, I get the need to limit resources. What if they constantly ask for more? If they constantly ask for more, it's, typic it's typically because you have the wrong things there or because they haven't repeated the activity enough to engage with the things that are there. So we're always on the lookout. And this is what this last quote was saying. We're, we're always thinking about the environment. We're always on the lookout for materials that are going to inspire your child. So as you organize the materials well and put out the things that the child enjoys and then target those things, look, I mean, you're always focusing on looking for the next thing that is going to inspire your child and draw your child in. So as you do that, as you improve doing that and as your, as your child begins to concentrate more, and to develop their creativity, then the things that are in your home begin to be enough. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Actually, Kelly, yeah. before we go on, do you have anything to add to that? I'd no, love I to hear if you have thoughts on that too. <laughs> um, no, I think you did a really thorough job. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any Montessori classroom materials for elementary age children that you suggest would be beneficial for a home Montessori learning environment to have? This is a good question. And it's also a very specific question because it depends on the ages of your children. It also depends on the personalities of your children. So Montessori materials in general are quite expensive. So it doesn't make sense to have a full Montessori learning environment um, at home, obviously. And this is particularly because many of these materials are used for only a certain amount of time, maybe six months or maybe a couple of months only. And so you're always waiting for that child to need that material in the classroom. There are some materials, though, that can be used over a longer period of time. And it's also possible to buy Montessori materials that are less expensive um, and that aren't designed particularly for you know, days and years of use in a busy classroom. So what I'll say about this is that we as an organization are certainly working on some recommend recommendations around this. Those aren't finalized yet, but in general, the key would be to Think about your child specifically and what they love and then to buy materials to fit your particular child rather than buying materials for a, a classroom that is, is uh, more general. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a question from Michelle. She asks, my 14 year old is an avid reader. Our problem is books. She likes to reread. We struggle with shelving problems. What are suggestions? Did I write this question? I'm just checking. I have a 14 year old and we have exactly the same issue. So uh, you said shelving options? 
Um, so yes, shelving so problems. The, yes, options. <laughs> the bottom line question is shelving problems. So this is where you have to get creative. My home, my my child's room, um, this same child, as far as I can tell, is about eight feet wide and maybe 10 feet long. And she has a bed in there as well in a loft. So we have shelves all along every side of the room. We also have, if you can see this, a large bookshelf over here that we use for all different kinds of storage. Can we see that, Kelly? Yeah. Yeah, we have a large bookshelf over here and we have another um, armoire over there. Can you see the armoire? Yeah. Yep. And the armoire also uh, has been used for book storage at different times. So the principle is to use your space well. Definitely have your girl go through the books on a regular basis and determine which ones she's ready to pass on. She may be more willing to pass some on to friends rather than um, just to simply donate them. Or she might have a favorite library that she'd be willing to donate them to. So, you know, work with her and work with your space. So Nadine has chimed in to say, yes, book hunger is real for my seven-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing, <laughs> for, for sure. sure. Um, all right, here's a question. I have a seven and 10-year-old who will be learning at home. I want to have a communal learning space in the living room along with personal spaces in their bedrooms where they can go uh, they can go to focus if they're getting distracted, as well as having a space they can personalize. What should my setup include for these spaces? Mm, so I hope that we've covered a lot of this during the time, um, during during this time here uh, in the webinar. But I would also like to add, you know, storage again, storage, storage, and storage. You need to have good creative storage solutions for your particular space. Anything you have that doesn't have a container is fair game for ending up all over the place. So whatever space that you have, focus on storage. But here, I'm gonna tell you something, when I moved out of my home in Canada to move down here to California, I went through all of our storage and I had basically continued to buy storage over a period of 10 years, hoping that that was going to solve our problem. I discovered that 50% of my storage, a full 50% of my storage was either empty or literally full of random papers that we could immediately just say, we're gonna throw these out. So having specific kinds of storage for the things you're actually using and constantly going through the materials that you have there to get rid of stuff that you don't need is the fundamental key. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here about motivation. Um, and so it seems like a good time to mention that we have another webinar coming up next Wednesday, um, May 6th, um, called Motivation in Your Elementary Child that will be addressing this in depth. Um, it's with Peter Pichet and it will be at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Um, 3 p.m. Eastern time. You can add, add or subtract an hour if you live in another time zone. Um, and if you want to know how to register for that, um, I'll be sending a follow-up email with that information, but you can also go into our event section in the elementary family framework to register for that. So I just wanted to mention that because it came up a couple of times. Thank you, Kelly. Can you also mention uh, would you mind bringing up those questions here? Because I'd love to answer some of them with relation particularly to the environment, if it is applicable. Sure, let me see. I think it might be um, a little bit more in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just scroll through and see if I can find one because I was I didn't have my um, cursor okay, on that. Go ahead, go, ahead and, yeah. go ahead and skip it. That's Okay, I can come back to it in a second once I can locate it. Um, I just don't want to waste time sure. here. Um, here's a question. How can I help my son um, who has ADHD and struggles to stay on task or can't focus long enough to learn? Mm -hmm. So all of these things will help. Think particularly about the social aspect. Often children with ADHD who have a partner that they can work together with to help them, you know, just to help remind them what the goal is can be um, 
can be really inspired. It can it can be very helpful. Um, now, of course, you need another child or a partner or even a grandparent who is open to kind of the fluctuations that that may entail. The other thing, you know, I, I feel like I'm harping on this, but less is more. If you have more stuff, it's harder for everyone to focus. So minimize the stuff. Also minimize the screen time. There's actually a research um, project that I read a little while back or a research report that I read a little while back and I, I need to hunt it down so that I could share it. I, I don't have it uh, where I can share it at this point, but it specifically said that even having TV on in the background increases symptoms of ADHD by something like 50%. So minimize screen time as much as you can and really focus on, and this is something that you'll really see actually in our elementary album, the activities there, you go into the computer to find your activity, but then once you've got the activity, you go out and you can close the computer and you do the activity in the world for many of those activities. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for lessons that are going to inspire your child, but then send him out off the screen to do the thing. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think that's that's really Actually, key. What and Kelly, I'd love to ask you, to, I wanted to ask you to chime in here too, if you have any insights. Um. Nothing off the top of my head, but I, I actually was able to find that other question. Um, oh, great. Thank you. Related to motivation, which was um, to get some tips on how to organize the space at home to help motivate him to work. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we covered that. I hope we covered that pretty thoroughly, that um, just being really specific about what the materials are, having beautiful materials, all of these things are going to be really helpful. Got a question from Elizabeth who says that her six year old daughter is going into lower elementary from children's house and they're currently learning from home with as many hands on materials as possible. Um, yeah. Any suggestions for that situation? So, actually, I'm going to address this for all of those of you with emerging readers. And I'm, I'm going to address this in kind of a funny way, because I know that we're often thinking with children at this age, we need them to write, we need them to read, we need them to do this more themselves. And I, I really want to encourage and inspire you to think way beyond the reading and instead to think of language and love of stories. So, and my daughter, who now at 14, reads a 400 page book a day sometimes did not read a chapter book on her own until she was almost nine before that she preferred that i read the book aloud but i always read books aloud to her that were a couple of years usually two to three years above her actual reading level it wasn't that she couldn't read she just never did it for fun but now she reads all the time and she writes very except really exceptionally well so my biggest suggestion would be to read to your children to enjoy the learning with them rather than trying to get them to produce especially during this time this time when we're all scattered and there's so much going on I would I would let go of a lot of the concerns about academics and instead look for what your child loves and explore that together with her and encourage her to find different ways to share her knowledge about that, whether it's she's practicing a play or she's practicing or she's making a poster, drawing a picture, you know, sculpting something, have her share her knowledge and help her to gain the knowledge if she's not yet doing lots of reading herself. That makes a lot of sense. You know, while you were talking, I was also thinking about um, if you do want to incorporate some hands-on work, rather than having to go order a whole new set of materials, think about things that you have around the house, like money, right? There's a lot of math work that you can do that's practical, sure. that's purposeful, you know, as you're thinking about going to purchase some food and kind of 
planning out a budget. You know, there, there's a lot of work around that. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, measurement. Um, there are probably some practical projects you have around the house that you could use some help measuring, and that would be a great thing to hand your child a measuring tape, right? That's not a, that's that's one of our materials in the classroom, but it also has a lot of applicability. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely baking too, so on the same yes. on the same wavelength. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was such a pleasure to meet all of you and to spend this time with you. Any questions that weren't answered? I will answer them on the family framework. We have both an elementary section and a zero to six section. So if you have younger children as well, we'd be happy to um, we'd be happy to share all of our family framework free resources with you for for all of the ages of your family members. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully, we'll see you next week uh, for Peter Pichet's motivation webinar. We look forward to seeing you there. Everybody, have a great day. Bye bye.